even smell maps to high, low, and bright, dark dimensions. And the relationship between color, odor, and intensity is very well known to sensory psychologists as well as to good chefs. So that, for example, we say that a darkly tinted liquid smells stronger than when it's pale, and it tastes stronger, too. And when, red wine, when white wine is surreptitiously colored red, it suddenly smells like red wine. Now, because sight, sound, and movement map to one another so closely, even bad ventriloquists can convince us that whatever's moving is doing the talking. Dance is another example of, of cross-sensory mapping in which body rhythms mimic sound rhythms, both visually and kinetically. Now, I want you to consider the following. When speakers of various tongues are tone shown two shapes, one that looks like a shard of broken glass and the other one like an amoeba blob, and told that in alien Martian language, one of these is called booba and the other one is called kiki, 98% of the individuals pick the jagged shape as kiki because its visual spikes mimic the kiki sound and the sharp motor inflection against the palate whereas the blob's visual contours are more like the auditory and motor inflections of booba. And this illustrates a general principle in biology that pre-existing analogs are often co-opted, so that synesthetic associations our ancestors made long ago have grown into the more abstract kinds of language that we understand today, and that's why metaphors make sense. Lawful relations among the senses suggest a cognitive continuum as perceptual similarities give way to synesthetic equivalences which go into metaphoric identities which segue into the abstractions of language. So it's the metaphor is the reverse of what most people commonly assume. It doesn't depend on a capacity for abstract verbal abstraction, but rather on a physical interaction with a concrete sensuous world. So far from being a mere curiosity, Synesthesia has caused a paradigm shift in two senses. For science, it, uh, it, uh, it illuminates a broad swath of the mind, and it forces fundamental rethinking about how brains are organized. 25 years ago, my, my colleagues insisted synesthesia could not be real because it contradicted theory. And today, synesthesia's reality has made theory change. Uh, the sense, the set, Senses are not as separate as we once thought they were. Those channels are quite close. And modularity as an organizing principle is not holding up. The other sense of a paradigm shift is what synesthesia means personally, because it, it highlights the amazing differences in which individual people see the world subjectively. And it reminds us that each brain uniquely filters out what it perceives in the first place. Now, artists try to make a living uh, conveying their point of view to us. But what do the rest of us do with ours? Do we conform or do we let ourselves shine? I mean, I think it's a very optimistic message that we harbor so much multi-sensory potential. The circuits are there, they're just waiting to rise to consciousness. So I hope that learning a little bit about this fascinating topic of perceptual synesthesia will lead each of you to new connections in your own endeavors and to enjoying these artworks in a whole new perspective. Thank you very much. Uh, synesthesia is the same, the gene frequency is the same, the expression of it is the same, the different varieties are the same. So there's nothing, there's nothing cultural. The, the culture comes in very early when there's, during this early period of de brain development, there must be some learning that attaches on to these neurons and then it stays stable for life. So could you work with infants and increase? Well, one of the most, some of the most fascinating research on synesthesia is being done by Daphne Maurer at McMaster University. She's an ne intensive neonatologist, and it's very, very hard to do experiments on newborns <laughs> and three months old, but uh, there are some very clever work being done with that. Yes. Somebody in the back had a question. Do you know of any synesthetic twins? Yes, there are synesthetic twins and synesthetic triplets. In fact, one of the most fascinating cases is the triplets in which one of them does not have synesthesia. So it's the wonderful little exceptions like that, that that are helping us tease out. There's a big race on in, th in Canada, England, and the United States to find the synesthesia gene. And it's actually 
I mean, here again, here's this obscure little quirk. It turns out that synesthesia is almost the perfect thing for perceptual genomics, bi biologic genomics, because you've got a very definite perceptual condition. Either you have it or you don't have it. It's fairly easy to phenotype that, as you can tell, that people really have it or not. Um, and, and it's a fairly common gene that you can get a, you know, get, find it in families and trace the gene. So it may be the first one in which you're able actually to map the gene uh, that's responsible for some aspect of perception. That's very exciting. I can't tell you who's winning the race, though. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, is there any real-time evidence in the form of nucleomagnetic resonance studies demonstrating that part of the brain lighting up? Yes, um, all the PET scans, xenon inhalation, MRI, all the various technologies, the EEG power spectrum analysis. They all show what you expect is that if you're, if you're seeing, if you're hearing color, um, that the, the color area lights up, for example. If you're tasting shapes, if you're tasting words, you have, again, the, the word areas and the taste areas light up. So multiple experiments show cross activation of different brain areas that are involved in a stimulus and a synesthetic response. Yes? Um, this exhibit mentions spiritual or cosmic ideas. Is, does that play into can either of you discussing it? I will say that um, there are, synesthetes have unusual experiences more often than the, the baseline population does, so clairvoyance, precognitive dreams, aura. There is a kind of synesthesia that's called, it's the simplest kind. I first called it, called it simple synesthesia. It basically, it's, people see auras over the Golden Gate Bridge or around their friends and their dogs and stuff. And it's, we now call it emotionally mediated synesthesia. And it turns out that like strangers, for example, won't have any color. But the closer you know somebody, the closer the emotional connection, the more intense the color goes. And, and that's, uh, so it just, it, affect is very key to, to perceptual synesthesia. We have a lot of hands. <laughs> In the back, yes. Have there been any studies of the relationship between synesthesia and perfect pitch? Uh, yes, actually there is. Uh, there is. Um, so there's a study done in 1980. And also eidetic memory, that synesthesia, it's a similar kind of thing. The similarities are, are very superficial. Again, it's a, it's a uh, it runs in families. It's an all or nothing thing. You either have it or you don't have it. It's apparent at a very early age without the need to practice or develop it. And uh, the people with perfect pitches express this astonishment that other people don't do this. How could you not do this? It's simply why, it's like, how can, how can, why don't you see this music? I don't understand. Have so. No, not, not any more than others. And they would very much disagree on, you know, that green would be A, for instance. I mean, because everybody perceives that differently. It could be yellow. <laughs> 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 well, we had, we had an artist, her, Carol's thing is, she, yes. she does letters or the sounds of letters with colors, and she has started this um, conference now of, of synesthetes. And she said the hardest thing is when you get a whole room full of them, they will not agree <laughs> on what the colors are that make up the alphabet, for instance. And so it's just yeah. like, you know. Carol also had a fascinating, Carol's also a sculptor, and she has a touch and color and shape, and particularly when she has acupuncture for her bad arthritic knee. And when the needle is being put in or removed, she says she sees this stream of shapes. She says, a year's worth of sculpture goes right by me in, in two seconds, and I just want to grab it. You yeah. know? 